What's up guys, and welcome to part six of Project 750 LI. In the previous video, we fixed up the transmission damage, bolted it back up to the engine, and then put the whole subframe assembly back in the car. After getting everything reconnected, we tried to start it up, but she wouldn't go. So I've been trying to figure out what the issue is, but if anyone was paying close attention to the last video, the fuel gauge showed it was totally empty. When I realized that, I thought maybe I put the fuse for the fuel pump back in the wrong spot, but I checked it and it was all good. Then I thought maybe there was a problem with the fuel pump because remember, when I bought the car, it wasn't actually running, so I have no idea what's good or bad until I test it. Luckily, before I went too far down that rabbit hole, I decided to use my scope to check and see if there was actually any gas in the tank. Any guesses? I know it's kind of hard to see here, but the fuel tank is bone dry. I'm not sure why it's completely dry. I guess they drained it when they put it in storage, but either way, we've got a couple of liters of gas here, so we'll fill it up and see what it gives. Okay, so we have fuel in the car now. I notice the fuel gauge still doesn't move. So I think there is a problem with the fuel pump. But we're gonna try anyway. Oh yeah. Okay, it was close there, something happened, so. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, well, it died pretty quickly there. Sometimes it takes a little while for fuel pressure to build up, so we'll try again. Okay, so we've got it starting. I got to open the door here because it's getting quite smoky. I'm also going to close this oil drain hole now because we see the oil spitting out everywhere. It's not going to run perfectly because I haven't reconnected the air boxes, which have the MAF on there, but it still should run somewhat. So we'll clean this up and we'll see what we can do. Okay, so now that we've got this reconnected, I've topped up all the fluids that have gone down and uh, let's see if it'll run a little bit longer now. starting to smooth out so there is going to be some whining because since i haven't reconnected the steering column i can't bleed the power steering yet it's also normal for there to be some smoke coming out here because there's all the oils and things that got stuck on the engine now as it starts to heat up those are going to burn off Good news so far, no leaks underneath. As I take a look around, it doesn't look like anything is leaking anywhere actually. All right, so I reconnected the cooling fan now. I'd already installed this in the last video, but I took it out again just to check for any leaks after the car started. After running for a few minutes, all the smoke cleared out, everything burned off, and now it's running reasonably well. Still not perfect because the maps and things aren't connected yet, but 
Before we put anything else back on, let's get a couple of sound clips of this thing running right out of the downpipes. Another thing is that the fuel gauge uh, finally moved. The jerry can that I had was a lot smaller than I thought. So now that I've added a couple of liters in, you can see the needle moves and it gives us some kind of estimate uh, for range. The engine has been running for a couple of minutes, so the oil is pretty warm. Now we can go ahead and give it a couple of revs. Sounds like a healthy engine to me. So now that we're sure that the car runs at least reasonably well, we're gonna go ahead, start reassembling everything. The only thing we're gonna leave off for now is all the plastic shields underneath because before I put all those on, I wanna take the car for a drive, make sure everything is working in the suspension. Then once that's done, we'll finish the full reassembly. Okay, so next up, I wanna tackle the whole front suspension here. There's a couple things I want to do. Number one, you'll see that this bump stop slash dust boot here is totally destroyed. So we'll take the shock off and replace that. To do that, normally this is not required, but I'm actually going to remove the whole front knuckle because that's going to give us a little bit more room and it's going to get a better camera angle. This is totally not required. You can just drop the three bolts that are holding the strut on the top and you can get it out from the back. But again, I just want to get a better angle here. Lastly, we'll tackle the brakes, which are not in terrible shape. There is a pretty good lip on the rotor, but there's still a good amount of pad left. Either way, I have a full set of brakes for the front and back, so we'll be changing all four sides. So I can tell that this bolt is seized up in the knuckle here. I'll start by trying to impact this side to get it out, but there's nothing actually holding this bolt in right now besides the corrosion. Yeah, so this thing is totally stuck in here. Uh, I see this really often on this style of bolt where it goes through the knuckle completely. There's salt and corrosion and whatever that gets inside and it gets all baked up. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the oxy torch. I'm going to be really careful because this ball joint here is still in good shape and I don't want to replace this control arm for nothing. So I'm going to spray it with water as I'm heating it. Once it's heated up, I'm going to hit it again with the impact. And with the impact, you go forward, backwards, forward, backwards to help loosen it up. And then you'll see once it breaks, there's going to be a big puff of salt and corrosion that comes out and then you'll know it's broken free. I totally forgot, but first we're going to remove the brake caliper. So that's two 18 mil nuts that hold the bracket on the back. Take this whole thing off and hang it up somewhere. That way we don't have to disconnect the brake line and deal with any of that. I'm going to spread the knuckle open with a chisel a little bit.
Okay. So now I'm gonna double check there's nothing still connected. I'm gonna take the ABS wire with me rather than trying to disconnect it from the knuckle. And now I'll remove the whole piece. You can see that this ball joint here is in great shape. Doesn't have any play. Same thing for the bushings in the back. So I'm not gonna to touch this arm. Now I'm gonna remove the whole strut. To do that, there's three bolts on the top and then there's this one connector that needs to be taken off here. Normally to do this job, BMW wants you to use another special tool to make sure that the top hat is aligned with the spring and is aligned with the shock body. I don't have that special tool and it's not really something you can buy. I also don't really think it's something that's very useful because most shocks will have some kind of aligning pin. So I think it's a pretty stupid design by BMW. What we're gonna do instead is we're gonna clean up a few sections, make a couple of marks with a pen and make sure that when we put it all back together, everything is lined up. Next up is my least favorite thing to do on any car, and that's using a spring compressor. Normally the style I like to use doesn't actually fit on this shock because there's not enough space between the springs. So instead I have to use the parts store specials. You can tell the shock is loose enough when you can start to spin the whole shock body over the spring. So here I can move it very easily. Now I'm gonna take the top nut off. This is an 18 mil. These nuts have to be replaced after you take them out. And now we should be able to pull the whole thing apart. Put the new top nut on. Now that that's back on, we can start loosening the spring compressors. One last time, as you're loosening, make sure that all your alignment marks are the right way. All right, now, now we can breathe. These things are finally off. Okay, cool. So now that we've got this all lined up, I'm gonna put the wiring harness back. I'm also gonna clean this upper ball joint. I'm gonna add a little bit of anti-seize just because, like I said, over time, there's nothing you can really do about this kind of corrosion that gets in between the cracks, but we'll do our best. Now, I don't know if this is really necessary, but it's something I always do. Hopefully it'll help the next guy have a little bit of an easier time. Unfortunately, I forgot to reconnect the axle and the way you're supposed to do it is actually reconnect it before you put the strut back in. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't realize that and uh, I don't want to undo it again. So I'm just going to reinsert it the same way I took it out, which is just to push the strut out of the way and then slide it in. The 
bolts come with a new spring and a new seal and they're torque to yield, which is why they need to be changed. I'm just gonna put this on loosely for now and then we'll come back and torque it once everything's back on the ground. So now to do all the control arms, I'm gonna use the hydraulic table again because the knuckle needs to be at right height when all these bushings are torqued. I also replaced this bushing in this thrust arm. This was done off camera, but rather than replace the whole arm, this bushing can be pressed out and it only costs about $25 instead of about $100 for the whole arm. The rest of the suspension components all look like they're in good shape. None of the ball joints have any play and all the bushings are tight. So we're gonna put it back together like this. And then once we take it for a first drive, if we notice anything, we'll come back and take another look. I couldn't get a very good shot of torquing down the tie rod because the torque wrench had to come right where the camera was. So it's a 21 millimeter with a T40 counter hold torqued at 165 newton meters. Okay, so now for the brakes. We've already removed the caliper in the previous step when we took off the hold knuckle. Those were two 18 millimeter bolts holding on the caliper bracket. Next, to take off the rotor, we need to remove the set screw. This is a six millimeter Allen. go and then we replace these either way so now there's nothing that's really holding this rotor on but as you'll see it's not coming off that's because it's just rusted onto the hub that happens there's not really much you can do about it so uh, we'll pull out the BMW special tool and uh, take this off properly so we just have to put one of the wheel bolts in Go simple as that. I know you guys may not believe me, but if you read the service manual, that is the special tool the BMW says to use. Next up, we have to clean the hub surface to make sure that the rotor is going to seat on a good surface. So this is the new part. It's an OE Pajid two-piece rotor with the aluminum hat. It's important to make sure that on the front brakes, it's the right direction because the vents inside are pointing a certain way. The back brakes don't matter, they're the same on both sides, but the front there is a right and left side. I don't even torque these screws. I just take my ratchet, Give it a little bump and that's it. So next up for the brake caliper, 
I'm gonna take this off the hook now. Normally I would have separated this while it was still on the car, but again, we were just taking it off when we removed the knuckles, so I didn't separate them. To do that, you're gonna pop these two dust caps off and then use a nine millimeter Allen to take the slide pins out. Now we can separate the caliper bracket from the caliper itself. And again, as you can see, there was still a lot of life left in these brakes, but I got a full set anyway, so I'm just gonna swap them out regardless. Now I'm just gonna clean up all the surfaces that the pads ride on, so these four corners in here, plus the bracket itself. So now that the caliper piston is pushed all the way in, first I'm going to install the brake caliper bracket, put the brake pads in with grease on all the surfaces. Then I'm going to take the caliper, slide the whole thing on top, and then put the two guide pins in. These are the brake pads I'm using, OE Pajid pads again, semi-metallics. I'm going to grease all four ears, put these in the caliper, and then put it back in the car. Wow. That took me a good 10 minutes just to get that clip on. So I've never seen this style of clip before. I've seen the kind that they use in the back, which is pretty easy, but this one is weird the way it's got to pry up and then that top's got to go in. So anyway, now that we've got this wrapped up finally, we're going to go do the same thing on the other side. I'm not going to show you guys because it's the exact same process. The only difference is on the driver's side, there's the brake pad wear sensor that's routed in the back and then connects up where the ABS sensor wire is. I always replace those when I do a brake job regardless, but if it hasn't actually been activated yet, so if the surface of the sensor hasn't started rubbing against the rotor, technically you can reuse that no problem. Now that we've got all four corners of brakes done, I'm going to make my way around the car and finish up any last odds and ends. So for example, ABS sensor, ride height sensor, brake sensor, make sure all those things are connected. Anything that we may have disconnected from the subframe when we removed it the first time. I'm also going to reattach the radiator support here with these two bolts on each side. Once that's done, we're going to go underneath the car, reconnect the drive shaft, reconnect the steering shaft, and then unscrew the transmission neutral release.
Okay, ready? Go. We'll just get up. And I'll just get it on the tip there. Perfect. Okay, okay, well, that's good, that's good. That's great. Okay, so now that we have this all hooked up, we can go back in the car, start it up with the exhaust on so we can listen to the difference of before and after. When the car is running, we're also gonna be able to bleed the power steering system because now that the steering shaft is attached, we'll be able to spin the wheels back and forth. And the last thing is to fill up the transmission fluid because it needs to be filled when the car is actually running and at operating temperature. Definitely a lot smoother and quieter than we had before. After we'll still come back and reset the check engine lights to clear out any residual codes from some of the stuff that still wasn't connected before. First, I'm gonna bleed the power steering. So we're just gonna turn the wheel lock to lock. Oh yeah. <laughs> It's already starting to get a lot smoother. Do this a few times. All right, we'll go check the level. It's gone way down and it's starting to bubble, which is normal. That's all the air leaving the system. So I'm gonna top this up and we'll keep going. Okay, so now that we're topped up here, something that I noticed while the car is running is that the fuel tank purge solenoid here is constantly clicking on and off. If I touch the pipe, I can feel the solenoid inside here turning on and off. And if I unplug it, it stops. So that'll be something we'll have to diagnose after. I'm not sure if that's how it's supposed to sound or if there's something wrong, but again, we'll take a look at that a little bit later. Coming back into the car. Now when we turn the steering wheel side to side, everything is very smooth, running properly. Since this car has dynamic drive, we also need to bleed the dynamic drive system. And to do that, we'll have to plug in our laptop with ISTA and start that test procedure. All right, so now that the transmission's filled, I've gone ahead and taken the car off the lift for the first time in months. I've torqued all the wheels, checked all the tire pressures. So now we're gonna do the dynamic drive self-test. 
This is important to do because it's gonna activate the dynamic drive system back and forth a few times to make sure there's no air in the lines. So again, in ISTA, under service functions, chassis and suspension, dynamic drive, and we're gonna do the startup. Start. VDM startup. So first we have to start the engine. It says here the engine speed is increased initially and then the initialization can be started following confirmation. Okay, continue service function. Okay, so we have to leave the vehicle and close the doors. I'm gonna do this from outside the car through the window, so just be careful because as soon as you press next, the car is gonna start moving. And there you go, it's gonna move back and forth a couple of times on both sides. And it looks really cool when it's doing this, almost like a lowrider. When the lights stop flashing, you know that the test is done. And it is normal, sometimes the car is gonna finish kind of sideways. So you see here that this side is a little bit lower, not really clear on camera, but this side is leaning down a little bit more. That's normal. In the procedure, it says that it can take about three minutes for the car to totally stabilize after the self-test is done. All right, so after a few minutes, like I said, the car did stabilize. So I think now is about time to take the car for a first drive. I haven't opened this door in a very long time. Unfortunately, it was snowing today in Montreal, so we're gonna have to take the car out in the snow. But it's looking pretty good. So I'll get my car out of the way and then we'll get this on the road. All right, guys, so I've got this GoPro on. I'm not really sure how it's gonna look, but we'll try it out. First order of business, we gotta take this thing off the mirror. Oh, it's taped on, are you serious? That's gonna be a mess to clean up after. All right, so here we are inside the car. You'll see there's a couple of things that we're gonna to have to do to the interior. For example, all these buttons here, they're all worn out, so I've got replacements for those. Same thing for the start button here. So we'll fire up the car. I have to reset all of these still. This is when I was checking the oil level. All right. So let's see this thing move under its own weight for the first time. Reverse, take the parking brake off. <laughs> yes. Uh, I know it snowed outside. I didn't really want to take it in the snow uh, before I put all the shields back on, but like I said, I want to test it first to make sure everything's working before we get everything back on. All right, I'm gonna close the door and I'll be right back. All right, so I've got the car out in the open now. This thing is really absolutely massive. If you'll notice, after a couple minutes of running, it started to make this squeaking noise. So I'm not sure what that is yet, but we're gonna take it just for a short drive down the street, come back, make sure everything sounds okay. Then we'll come back and try to diagnose what the problem is. All right, let's see how she goes. So transmission's shifting nicely. Engine sounds good too. And you can tell, I mean, I'm not even on the car, but this thing has so much torque, even just from a dead stop. 
close this window here. The car is quite quiet inside and we haven't even put all the shields back on yet. So we got a little turn coming up here. We'll be able to see how that dynamic drive feels. Wow, that feels really nice. <laughs> I wasn't expecting such a boat to be able to handle like that. And I mean, the interior of this car is just absolutely beautiful. The BMW individual, the wood, the leather, everything is super soft, everything is really nice. The car is in really great shape. It's too bad that at only uh, 81,000 kilometers, uh, it already needed almost a full engine rebuild, but that's how these cars are. If you look up N63, pretty much every single one of the early ones they made was a total nightmare. And right now we're just driving in comfort mode. Actually, let's turn it into Sport Plus, just to see how that feels. Sport Plus goes into Sport Traction, stiffens up the suspension a little bit, and makes the throttle more responsive. So, <laughs> I can definitely tell the throttle's responsive. In comfort mode, that's the first thing I noticed. I think you have about a third of the pedal that almost does nothing in this car. I mean, it's meant for luxury, it's not meant for racing. So let's do this turn again here. Yeah, she goes, sounds great. So it's definitely building boost properly. Those turbos we rebuilt are working well. And uh, yeah, you can tell when you come to a stop like that and you try and roll through when you're in Sport Plus, the transmission feels a little bit jerky. I wish I had gotten the refresh model with the eight speed transmission because there's a huge difference between the ZF six speed and the ZF eight speed. The six speed is all right, but the eight speed is really on another level. Okay, so what I notice is that that wine is a lot more present at idle. Once you start moving, it pretty much goes away. Let's pop the hood and take a look. So it sounds like the whistling is coming from the back of the engine. It's hard to tell. All right, I'm gonna take this GoPro off and we'll switch back to the regular camera. So after looking at it for a few minutes, the sound is definitely coming from the back of the car. So if I come underneath, I can actually hear it really well coming from under the car. It sounds like a whistling. Not really sure what it could be. Oh boy. All right, so there's a lot of pressure under the oil cap right now. Yeah, and as soon as I open that, the whistling goes away. Yeah, after a couple seconds, that pressure builds up pretty fast. All right, guys, so I'm gonna call that done. Honestly, I'm still pretty happy with the progress we've made. I mean, the car moved under its own power for the first time since I bought it last fall. The engine sounds really good and the car's driving smoothly down the road. So we'll have to try and figure out what this issue is in the next episode. <laughs> Normally pressure under the oil cap like that, the first thing I would assume would be PCV related, but we've already replaced both PCV valves plus the oil separated under the valve cover. So I'm not really sure what it could be. Either way, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Thanks a lot for watching and stay tuned for part seven coming soon. Thanks guys.